So I want to welcome you to our plenary session, Responses in Adolescence. Um, the conference theme, Whose Children Are They? Responsibilities for Religious Formation of a New Generation, um, really creates a unique opportunity to explore um, the religious education needs of adolescents and responsible ways to meet those needs. And so our group of panelists today will actually invite us to reflect on various ways this question has and continues to be answered for both good and ill. With that said, I would like to actually introduce our four panelists for the evening. Um, and the way we're gonna do this session is um, it will be primarily questions that will raise, I'll raise those questions. Um, I encourage you if you have questions that you would like to put in the chat to put those in the chat because there will also be a time for um, Q&A from the audience or participants. And so I also invite you to go ahead and just put those um, questions in the chat. Um, but I will um, begin by asking questions of our panelists. And so we have four um, panelists that I'm excited to um, engage this rich conversation with. Um, Dr. Annie Lockhart Gilroy is Associate Professor of Christian Education and Practical Theology at Phillips Theological Seminary in Tulsa, Oklahoma. She is also the author of Nurturing the Sanctified Imagination of Urban Youth and co-editor of From Lament to Advocacy, Black Religious Education and Public Theology. She is also an ordained deacon of the United Methodist Church and has served several congregations focusing on youth ministry and Christian education. We also have Dr. Carmichael Crutchfield, who is an ordained elder in the Christian Methodist Episcopal Church and professor of Christian education, spiritual formation, and youth ministry at Memphis Theological Seminary. His research interests include human development, the human brain, the formation and nurture of Christians, African adolescent, American adolescent males, critical pedagogy, discipleship, and contemplative um, pedagogy. Dr. Aussie La is a senior lecturer at the Chinese University of Hong Kong an affiliated assistant professor in the Department of Buddhist Studies at Fogang University. Her research interests include contemplative education, lay Buddhist meditation, and transnational meditation movement in contemporary Chinese societies. And lastly, we have Dr. Mubini Kramani, who graduated from uh, Harvard, Cambridge, and has been a professor of education at Towson University for over 30 years, teaching at primary, secondary, and higher levels of education. She is also the recipient of the 2015 President's Diversity Award at her institution and is the chief editor of the soon to be released book, Supporting Children and youth through spiritual education. And so this, I hope, gives you a um, insight into who our panelists are and the rich um, diversity of experiences they bring to this conversation on exploring the needs of adolescents and just our responsibility with that. Um, and so the first question I wanna ask our panelists is kind of a little bit of an orienting question. And that question is, who do we mean when we say adolescents and or young adults? Who are we talking about? I could go ahead and get us started with that one. Um, um, before I talk about who I mean, um, and I like to fo focus mostly on who we mean when, we, when I talk about adolescents, I'd like to talk about why it is actually so kind of wishy-washy and hard to define. Um, so I understand adolescence as beginning with the start of puberty. And puberty is starting earlier than it used to, but there are still pinpoints and averages of when the body starts to change. So that's a little easier to kind of narrow down. Adolescence, I would argue, ends with adulthood. But whenever I ask my students, 
you know, when is that? What is an adult? I usually get a response like when someone can be fully responsible for themselves. Mm. And I go, okay, so, so when is that? Um, I forgot my laptop this morning. I had to go back home and get it. Sometimes I don't feel like I can be fully responsible for myself. And I'm middle age, like I'm good and grown, right? Um, so what does that mean? Um, while there are groups in the United States, right? That's a culture that I focus on that have rites of passages that mark the start of adulthood, right? Bar mitzvah, bat mitzvah, um, kitzeneras, right? There's different groups that have um, a marking a rites of passage. It isn't a universal cultural norm. So for many, adulthood has this wishy-washy start. So therefore, adolescence has a wishy-washy end. Um, understanding that this can be arbitrary, I still feel the need to give some ages. So I view adolescence as 13 to 18. Um, at 13, most people have started puberty. Um, at 18, most people have legal agency to make decisions for themselves and are seen as a legal adult. And that's my reasoning for that. Um, as wishy-washy as that is, we know there's still brain development happening. Um, you know, we know that people from different cultures are seen as more adult as others than others. Um, and I also recognize that some people can be emancipated earlier than 18. I would consider them adults. I also recognize that some at a later age may still not have legal agency. And I also consider them adults. Um, and I recognize the difficulty of any age qualifications, but still I think it's important to have them. So I usually say 13 to 18, a young adult would then be 18 to 30. Um, and that age range is even more arbitrary. Um, but in the interest of time, I'm gonna let somebody else tackle that one <laughs> and pass it along. Well, I'll, I'll jump in and, and say that, uh, first of all, when I see the word adolescence, I know I'm talking uh, academics uh, because um, in for me in the church, it's uh, about youth and that's what uh, the word is used. And when I think of adolescence and that's what I tend in, I, I research shows and about development and all of those kinds of things. And then the second part of that about uh, young adults, uh, I have um, been working from the premise of, from Jeffrey Arnett's uh, work about emerging adults. And so from 18 to 24, uh, I sort of, um, uh, 25 in that neighborhood, sort of see that as young adults. And uh, because I have done a little bit of uh, research with the human brain, um, I, I see that adulthood is really uh, when the brain is more fully developed around 25 years age. So youth, I, when doing some reading from some older books, I've seen where youth uh, has been have has been described from ages 10 to, to 24 um, and a lot of other uh, places or times. But primarily for, for me, uh, because uh, the context of which I uh, speak uh, basically comes from a um, academic, but more and more church where I see the real uh, rubber meeting the road in church from ages 12 to 17 uh, is designated uh, as, as adolescence or youth and uh, emerging adults uh, around 18 to 25. And then uh, from there on to about 35 or so uh, young adults. And so uh, the preparation uh, of activities or work or ministry or whatever we call the words that we do uh, would be around using those particular uh, concepts. And um, um, the church is primarily the, um, the environment or the context uh, in which I or on a specific communion, my own specific denomination or communion is basically the context that I talk when I talk about adolescence. 
but uh, it expands more because um, I use, I have a program that I do with adolescent boys uh, that expands to people who may be or may not be Christian. So it's pretty expansive. But in answer to the question about adolescents, uh, who I'm talking about are youth ages from 12 to 17 and young adults is from ages 18 to 24 or 25. If I can make, add a couple of more points about uh, adolescents, I think oh, the way I understand it is uh, the fact that they are entering puberty, there are lots of hormonal changes that are happening uh, in the lives of adolescents. Uh, it's a very, it can be a very volatile stage for them. It can be a very sensitive stage. They're going through uncertainty, uncertainties, finding a place in society. And so um, adolescents, uh, you know, can uh, are at a point where they are exploring different ideas. They are likely to deviate from traditional lifestyles, uh, likely to challenge authority. Um, so it's very important, I think, for us uh, trying to support uh, ad adolescents and young adults to be present in their lives so that uh, they know that there is support. And also at this point, they are in a position to think unlike the children at the, at the childhood stage where they are thinking more in tangible terms and concrete terms, adolescents have the capacity to think more logically, more abstractly. So when we talk about religious education, uh, they, we can engage adolescents in ways that can, uh, where they're able to make uh, you know, logical and complex connections between the visible and invisible. Uh, so you know, if they're thinking about the divine, uh, they can also see its manifestations around them in the physical world. Um, adolescents, I would say, can engage in spiritual conversations in broader and deeper ways. I'll stop there. Thank you. Um, I just wanna draw your attention to the chat. If you have any resources related to this topic or you hear something from one of the panelists and you think of a related resource, feel free to drop it in the chat. And um, there's also a resource list if you want, you can also add whatever resources you have to that resource list, and that link is in the chat. So I just wanted to make mention of that. Um, our, our next question um, is centered around spirituality. And so I asked about what do we mean when we say adolescence? And now I want to ask another kind of uh, question about what do we mean? So how are we defining spirituality and why do we think it's important for young people? How do we define spirituality and why do we think it's important for young people? Well, I'll jump in uh, with that question. Um, um, at, at one point in, in my life, if someone would have asked me about spirituality, I probably would have said um, very clearly uh, it has to do uh, with one's relationship with uh, Jesus Christ. Um, but now um, um, I do still believe that spirituality has to do uh, with one's um, relationship with God or higher being, whatever we might call God. Um, but I was given um, greater insight about spirituality uh, when I started teaching uh, class um, uh, Christian education in the African American church, uh, and using my own book as well as using uh, the work, uh, particularly that of Yolanda Smith, uh, reclaiming the spirituals, and um, when I started looking and using that book, I started seeing spirituality as connected, as a connection of things because she talks about um, a Christian education 
from a sense of uh, the triple heritage of the African, being African, African-American and Christian. Um, and so for me, uh, I, it took me and has taken me and looking at um, the spirituals that she spoke of, the Negro spirituals and how tightly linked uh, they were focused on the authors of that, those songs. Um, in that case, those people who had been enslaved and but the gospels i mean the uh, spirituals were a message of jesus christ a message of good news uh out of the bible uh, for them so all of that uh, put together sort of gives me a sense of spirituality has to do with the sense of connecting our lives um uh and with meaning having meaning in our lives and how we make sense of the world how we make um, the meaning of the world becomes like faith. It becomes a sense of what are the things that make sense that pull the world together. And it includes all of the things that, uh, that we may be involved in or a part of. And that's where the triple heritage is important. Um, when you talk about the sense of being um, from an African-American standpoint, being Africa, African, African-American and Christian, and how all of that relates to uh, to God or the higher being that we might um, worship or the one that we turn to to make meaning out of life. Uh, so spirituality is that connection for me uh, to a world uh, that's um, sometimes really fuzzy. So when I now hear people say I'm spiritual but not re religious or I don't believe in the church or something, I begin to think a little bit deeper about what they're really saying when they're talking about spiritual uh, versus being going to church or religion. So for spirituality for me is that connection uh, to, to the world that makes sense and how we make sense of the world uh, through our faith or through our connection with God or the higher power that we serve. Hi. Uh... So I would like to uh, can share. Can I? Can you hear? Yeah, I would like to share um, some uh, something about uh, uh, a, in a broader context. Uh, so uh, when we uh, when we talk about uh, adolescents and young adults, uh, I uh, what pop up in my mind is uh, more about uh, the well being uh, of uh, these these groups. And also uh, the vulnerable uh, status uh, of uh, those adolescents and young um, adolescents and young adults. Uh, for example, in uh, in the context of my um, uh, communities or my societies, the Hong Kong uh, Chinese contest, um, uh, we we have uh, oh, at least thirty percent of university students uh, suffer from uh, depression. And uh, and the university could uh, hardly reach uh, those uh, who are in need uh, for uh, for helping for helping them. And so uh, for uh, the about the definition of uh, spirituality, uh, I would suggest a, a broader sense uh, from um, Jack Miller uh, that is the need to provide a broad framework uh, incorporating uh, the interconnectedness. With the principles of interconnectedness and also a whole person, and uh, and also uh, with the uh, uh, definition uh, suggested by uh, Hay and Nine uh, about spirituality, uh, with the three categories uh, of spiritual sensitivity, uh, that is awareness sensing, mystery sensing, and value sensing. So that is about um, to, to develop the, the awareness about here and now, uh, tuning, flow, and focusing. Uh, it can be a, a connectness uh, with uh, the God and also the, uh, the um, universe, uh, a, a broad sense of um, uh, um, spiritual uh, beings. So uh, mystery sensing uh, uh, means the sense of a uh, wonder and an awe and imagination about the world and uh, and the universe, uh, so that um, uh, 
the adolescents and young adults that they um, uh, develop that sense that uh, the positive meaning uh, uh, about um, uh, in uh, their lives and also um, are serving the community in this world. And uh, finally, it's about uh, developing um, the uh, capacity of searching uh, the ultimate meaning of life um, with the uh, ultimate goodness and meaning. So um, I stop here. I would like to add to the definitions uh, that were just presented. Um, I'd like to focus on the more current scientific definition of spirituality, um, uh, which is that it is an innate capacity, an innate human capacity to connect deeply within oneself and beyond, such as to the higher presence, um, and you know, and to offer service to a cause greater than ourselves. And to the second question that was asked. Why do we think it is important for young people? Uh, spirituality is important for young people because scientific research now for a quarter of a decade provides evidence that there is a strong spiritual core um, actually helps with health benefits, um, you know, and shields individuals from mental health issues. What was just, uh, we were just informed about it. And uh, groundbreaking uh, evidence from MRI and fMRI studies of the brain reveals the surprising science of spirituality uh, based on studies by Lisa Miller and her team at Columbia University. Children with positive active relationships with spirituality are 40% less likely as teenagers, as adolescents, to use and abuse drugs 60% less likely to fall into depression, 80% less likely to engage in risky behaviors, such as irresponsible sex and causing violence to themselves or to others. Uh, in fact, spiritual nur nurturing is more likely to have positive markers for thriving and high level of academic success, both for children, for adolescents and youth. Therefore, spirituality is very, very important to adolescents, both as a compass and as an anchor during this volatile, volatile time of their lives. I'll stop there. Thank you. Um, the next question I wanna raise is um, still connected to this question around spirituality. And that question is, what do adolescents say about their spirituality or their faith? Um, what do you, what do you hear adolescents say? How do you think it matters for them? their spirituality or faith? How do you think that matters for them? If nobody's answering, I will. Otherwise, I think, uh, Carmichael, were you trying to respond to that or should I wait for you? Go ahead. No, go ahead. I'll, I'll respond after you respond. Well, I just want to refer to a study that I was personally involved in, where, which involved adolescents and young adults. Uh, this was a longitudinal study where a survey was uh, given and they were asked three simple questions. Uh, th these were adolescents starting from ages 17 and above. Three questions were, how do you define your spirituality? How do you experience it? And what factors influenced your spirituality? And the interesting part here is that there were three key phrases that adolescents uh, defined or uh, described that were um, uh, very telling. The, the, while there was no common thread that I, we could find across uh, the adolescent spirituality, the three phrases that were used were one, one was, and we've already heard, heard that term, a seeking for, uh, 
And I will uh, quickly share here what were the, uh, you know, seeking for. The second one was a connection to or a connecting to and a feeling of. So seeking for meaningful meaning in life, seeking for truth, seeking for inner peace, seeking for higher presence. Other words used to describe their spirituality was search, a quest. And the second phrase that was used by the adolescents uh, was connection to, to inner self, to nature, to human suffering, to music, to a higher being or higher presence. And the third one was a feeling of, a feeling of inner peace, feeling of comfort, feeling of happiness, contentment, empathy, oneness, and so on and so forth. So for adolescents, when they talk about their spirituality, it is both a cognitive and a social, emotional experience and expression. And so we need to be, I think, cognizant about how they, they experience and express spirituality. And I, while I have the screen, I'm just going to share with you one more quick slide in terms of what were some of the contexts within which adolescents uh, describe their spirituality. There is the sensocentric, uh, and these are classified based on the narratives that were provided. Uh, adolescents experience spirituality through their senses. Uh, when they see something beautiful or the sound of music or movement, texture, sometimes the spirituality is ex experienced through relationships uh, with others, uh, with God, you know, and through that, they can develop the sense of cooperation, care, kindness, forgiveness. Uh, adolescents also experience, I mean, express it through ecocentric connection with nature. And that can lead them to, you know, projects like gardening and, uh, you know, conservation and so on and so forth. Cosmocentric observation of the cosmos, what we talked about of awe and wonder. Geneocentric remembering, connecting to the ancestors, uh, to the through the memorials. You know, life and death can be moments for extreme. Uh, awakening of spirituality. And, and, and so this is how they were describing it. And we classified them in seven spiritual identities. Chronocentric are particular times. For example, when it's Christmas, we may tend to be more spiritual in our, in how we think and feel about things. Certain events, rituals are all, um, uh, you know, ways of, um, that might evoke spirituality one in oneself. The final one is transocentric, and that is when you're pondering beyond the physical, thinking about the divine, from the physical to the metaphysical, and the sense of completeness and all that. Um, so there are all Dr. these- Dr. Kermani, do you have the uh, second slide? Um, someone in the chat asked if you could actually share that second slide. I know you- Can you see the slide on the screen? Uh, okay. No, you will actually have to stop sharing the current slide and then put up the second slide. So if you could okay. stop the current screen sharing and then you can um, share your second slide. Okay. So this, these were, I, I don't know if I, you were seeing this. Yes, thank you. Yes, but all I'm saying is that there are different contexts in which adolescents talk about their spirituality and the young adults do. And so spirituality is again, uh, sensocentric could be sociocentric, ecocentric, cosmocentric, geniocentric, chronocentric, which is time related and transocentric. And I think what the lesson we can get from this is that uh, spirituality does not have to happen within the confines of a church or a temple or a mosque that we as especially religious leaders need to be aware that spirituality can be experienced and felt in much deeper and broader contexts. And so we may be able to uh, take that into consideration as leaders of religious uh, you know, traditions and, and 
and allow, create spaces where adolescents and young adults are able to talk about their spirituality in all these different contexts. And again, also, these are not mutually exclusive. So one can talk about a beautiful picture or a flower and then connect it to the divine. You know, so there are so many pathways to connect to the divine. I'll stop here. Thank you. Well, I'll, I'll um, uh, attempt to, to talk to this, going, going back to context, um, uh, context being uh, in the African-American arena uh, with um, uh, in the book that um, um, Pressing Forward, uh, Denise Jansen and I talk about, I'm doing some interviews uh, with, with young people and you start talking about spirituality, it leads to talking about practices um, more so than the word for spirituality and what are those practices that help um, engender spirituality. Um, worship, uh, prayer, uh, and particularly music, and the importance of those, and all of that is a part of connecting, uh, going back to um, my earlier statement about spirituality, connecting uh, people to the world uh, which they know it, uh, and the context in which they live in, and the words that uh, connect them. So worship becomes important um, and how and what we do in worship uh, helps engender a sense of spirituality. Um, and uh, I, I am of the contention uh, that worship has um, a tremendous importance uh, as far as the formation of spirituality in adolescents, um, as well as in adults for that matter. Um, so how well we do it uh, will oftentimes help uh, determine uh, the spirituality when we're talking about Christian spirituality. And so most of the young, most of the people that uh, uh, we interview um, had, even though they may not have had a, a relationship presently with the church, uh, knew something about the church through their parents or their grandparents or someone uh, who they had heard either singing or praying or uh, witnessing or something, a testimony or, or some nation, even though they may not have gone to church. Uh, so spirituality um, makes me think that uh, how um, it, it comes about or um, uh, and what they say about it is it doesn't always happen in church, uh, but uh, church has an important uh, place for it because of the aspect of worship and worship and testimony and prayers and music all are important uh, for engendering a sense of spirituality, of Christian spirituality um, for uh, adolescents as well as it is with adults. And uh, uh, so that's, um, uh, that's my take on, on why um, oh, the question is, what do um, adolescents say about spirituality or faith? Um, and I think that's what they're, they're saying to me is what I hear them saying to me as I've interviewed and talked to uh, young people about spirituality. Um, and they probably the word spirituality itself probably is not in part of that conversation, uh, but uh, the sense of faith is a part of that conversation and believing in a power that's higher than them. And most of them would be those that I come in contact with in this regard would be those who know something about God because of their parents or grandparents or relatives who they have heard speak of, of this God. And I will add that. So a lot of what I am hearing at this stage, I'm actually hearing secondhand. I teach a class called Adolescent Spirituality. Um, and the first assignment is for each student to actually go speak with an adolescent about their spirituality. And there's some themes that come back, much of the themes you've already heard. Um, so I will just add one that I find particularly interesting because these are mostly um, people who work in Christian congregations. 
So they're talking to kids at youth group, right? Um, various races, but mostly Protestant, right? Children around Oklahoma area. Um, and the term spirituality sets many of the students back a little bit, right? Either because they see it as an academic term. So they will respond, okay, well, you do spirituality, like we do faith, right? So there's a separation there. And an idea that um, because maybe they have heard the term spiritual, but not religious so much, there's a concern that one could not be spiritual and religious, right? That it is so separated. Um, and I find that interesting <laughs> to hear back because it is a theme that I'm constantly hearing once again from, from youth that are often being talked about in youth group, right? So these are regular church going youth group kind of kids, um, kind of pushing back the term a little bit and maybe seeing it as something and wondering, should this be embraced? Right. So I push back and I say, but we do we talk about spiritual practices? Well, spiritual practices, okay, that sounds fine, which goes along with what Carmichael was saying, right? The spiritual practices are fine. Spirituality, however, hmm. Right. So there seems to be some disconnect that I have found when speaking um, with youth of, of a particular faith. I would like to uh, add uh, something about uh, the questions uh, of how do uh, adolescents say about their spirituality. Uh, in our uh, contest, uh, uh, the ter the, they don't use the term spirituality uh, uh, very often, but um, for um, referring to the term or about the practices, uh, is more uh, con uh, concrete uh, for the adolescents. So I can share uh, a quote uh, from uh, my recent research about mindfulness uh, for uh, the adolescents uh, in the Hong Kong contest. For example, uh, Paul from secondary school, uh, so he, uh, he is about uh, 16 years old. He mentioned that uh, his pressure and anxiety originated from uh, his academic study and family conflicts. And facing those uh, bad mood and impulsive thoughts, Paul would practice mindfulness in daily activities. So, uh, quote, when I was taking a shower, I would pay attention to the water flow and temperature. I try to shift the attention on those things for relaxation. And gradually, I would maintain a certain level of attention through the practices." End quote. So what Paul uh, shared uh, with us uh, is about the body-mind, uh, the changes of the body-mind uh, through uh, the daily life practices. And and that is how uh, he could um, ex exemplify or uh, demonstrate uh, the spirituality uh, in daily lives. So I uh, stop here. Thank you. Um, so we've talked a little bit about defining spirituality and um, kind of what adolescents say about their faith and perhaps why it matters for them. And so this, Next question is centered around teachers and youth workers. What are your expectations of teachers and youth workers um, as they seek to um, nurture uh, adolescent spiritual, uh, for adolescent spiritual nurture? What are your expectations for that? I will start and say, with the expectation that they nurture their own spiritual lives um, for a variety of reasons, right? Um, but I think that not only because it models to others, um, but that they can also have the experience of a variety of spiritual journeys. And I think as been mentioned before for children and for youth throughout this conference, 
is realizing that there are different spiritual practices that work for different people and spirituality is not a cookie cutter thing. And you do damage when you say, this is how one behaves as a spiritual person. This is what spirituality has to look like for you. Um, that does that does damage to spiritual development. But one who has who nurtures their own spiritual lives and has gone through various processes and realizes that sometimes you have to try on different spiritual practices and see what fits you. And also recognize that sometimes a spiritual practice fits you at some points in your life and not at others. Walking through that process, I think, is necessary as you walk others through that process as well. Um, and the other thing that I would add is one of the things that is odd about adolescence, which I call um, being a being a child in an adult body mm -hmm. calls for a particular type of protection. It's important for me that we remember that adolescents are children because that gives us a sense that we must protect them in a particular way, right? Um, and we know that, especially for adolescents who inhabit black and brown bodies that they are often seen as older <laughs> and more threatening. Um, and it is important that they are seen as children in need of protection, bodily protection, spiritual protection, all sorts of protections. So I would say those two things to start with. <laughs> I think that um, uh, part of that expectation that I would have of teachers, I have of teachers and youth leaders and of myself uh, is to, um, um, is to um, the responsibility and spiritual nurture involves the, the, my responsibility as a teacher or a youth leader to uh, expose uh, uh, youth uh, to various kinds of ways in which spirituality can be uh, enhanced or are embodied uh, and not be stuck in one place at all time doing the same thing all the time um, uh, contemplative practices singing um, praying um, various types of music um, all of the playing godly play all kinds of ways of exposing uh, so that uh, you can see um, as sort of what Annie was saying you're modeling uh, that that it is that you're nurturing your own spirituality in this process but you're also helping them to see that there's no just set way of doing it I mean that there's this is the only way that you're going to have a have spirituality if you practice these several things but I think it uh, we owe it as uh, teachers and uh, nurturers of youth uh, to find as many ways that we can expose uh, our young people to um, and to uh, particularly do things that uh, are uncomfortable for us um, that um, stretch us and uh, cause us to grow as a process and also might and will cause youth to grow in the process because many of the things that we do and expose my experiences men that many of the things we when we expose youth to things that are beyond their experience all it causes is is growth and um so that's what i i would say is one of the expectations um or are the exposure that ex exposure would be that um responsibility uh, to Add further to what Annie and Carmichael said, um, especially about the teachers being tuned into their own spirituality, um, own personal spirituality, and then demonstrating for the students in terms of their language of compassion, care, love, kindness, gratitude, forgiveness. So students can emulate that behavior and language with their peers and others within their community. I think teachers need to sh show that aspect of them fully 
their vulnerability, their, you know, their sense of compassion and all that. The, the other thing that uh, I think teachers, and this happens in religious schools, and I can say from my own experiences, often in religious education, dogma and rituals tend to take over spirituality. And so the, the, the question for us is, how do we ensure that the rituals and dogma do not overtake spirituality? And, and, and interestingly enough, my work also in, in public schools is that this term, what was uh, any talking about the difference between spirituality and religion, it's often confused. It's often confused. And I think that one of the biggest uh, roles that we have as adults is how do we uh, inform our education teach you know religious teachers leaders the difference if there is any between spirituality and religion from my own perspective they are interrelated but they are not identical and so but but the key thing again is how to prevent uh, the dogmas and the rituals. And in the, pro the problem in the public schools, again, is this confusion between religion and spirituality to the point where often the spiritual aspect of a child or young adult is shunned because it's, if you talk about spirituality, it is thought of as religion when actually, they're, again, they're interrelated, but they are not identical. So in schools where there is separation of church and state, there should not be any conflict because spirituality and religion, um, again, are not identical. I'll stop there. Um, I would like to uh, echo uh, Kamani and uh, Kamiko's uh, sharing uh, about uh, expectations of teachers and youth workers on uh, spiritual uh, nurture and spiritual education and uh, in the in our contest um we uh, there are religious schools uh, and also uh, non-religious schools so uh, I, I would like to add that uh, the issue is also about uh, how can uh, teacher uh, how can teachers and also youth workers um uh, equip themselves uh, in their uh, spiritual awareness and also uh, when they serve uh, those adolescents or young adults uh, with uh, different uh, backgrounds and different faiths, how to uh, how to accommodate this uh, um, multicultural contest um, uh, with uh, different uh, faiths, uh, but um, we also have the uh, core uh, uh, core spirituality, um, uh, including uh, the kindness, compassion, and uh, forgiveness, uh, etc. So that is um, what I would like to add. And in the non-religious context, uh, uh, I would like to add uh, one uh, one point that um, uh, in the Asian context we uh, include life and death education. So uh, these to topics, so topics in life education and death education uh, overlaps with uh, spirituality and uh, topics on uh, spirituality. So um, this is also one, um, uh, one uh, dimension that uh, uh, we can work with uh, adolescents and also young adults. Thank you. Thank you. Um... So I want to make mention that there are questions um, in the chat, and I will come back to those questions. If you have other questions that you want to raise, um, feel free to put those in the chat as well, and we will come back to those questions um, and ask our panelists to respond um, to those questions. Um, the other, the next question I want to raise is what encourages, so you've talked about expectations, um, what encourages and impedes the fulfillments of the expectations that you've um, identified. Um, and so what challenges even do teachers or faith leaders face?
are there political, social, and legislative um, constraints that you see as um, encouraging or impeding uh, teachers and youth workers, uh, adolescent spiritual nurture of? Yeah, I, I would uh, say yes, uh, Sarah, to that question. That's, that's where I would begin is that um, socioeconomic, political uh, issues, um, uh, cultural issues that um, impede. Uh, and I think that um, probably oftentimes, maybe at the top of it in my context would be poverty that um, leads to um, a whole set of uh, issues uh, that um, um, make it challenging for those who's teaching public spaces of any kind or private spaces for that matter, um, because of the culture um, in which um, many uh, people are dealing. And then you put that on, tar on top of a, 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 um, a push uh, for in many uh, religious circles uh, for what Christian Smith talks about, this moral uh, um, therapeutic deism um, that is used as uh, the place to, to try to teach adolescents and um, impedes uh, the sense of being able to be, uh, to move into the real questions and relationships that are needed and uh, impedes opportunities for dialogue and questions that need to be raised um, by those that we teach. Um, and um, I think that's one of the challenges and that impedes somewhat of the, prog the process because after all, I think uh, one of the large, large impediments is uh, sometimes our inability to, to listen. We talked about, oh, go ahead. Did somebody? Um, I think uh, where Michael said it so correctly, the inability to listen and often our own myopic view about spirituality and religion where when it comes to diversity, not understanding that, again, that this is an innate capacity. Spirituality is an innate capacity that is experienced by all, regardless of their religious background or non-religious background. And how do we in classrooms create spaces which allow different voices to share about spirituality? Um, and, and to be careful that as teachers, especially working in diverse settings, how do we prevent ourselves from imposing either mm -hmm. by ourselves or you know, amongst peers, one particular ideology of religion uh, and, and so on and so forth. So how do we create open spaces so that there is this sense of sharing, whether it's transcendental spirituality or whether it's ecocentric spirituality to allow spaces, even taking our students out into nature so that they experience the awe and wonder and connection to the divine and, and give them spaces to talk about it, you know. Um, so that would be one way of um, fulfilling, uh, the teachers fulfilling the need of the adolescents to share and to nurture their spirituality. Yeah, I echo uh, Kamani and also Kamiko about that, uh, um, the challenges for uh, school teachers and also uh, youth workers would be the vulnerability of uh, the adult, adolescents and also young adults. For example, the unhealthy uh, lifestyle, uh, peer pressure, and also the changing uh, self-identity uh, in facing the developmental uh, challenges. Uh, so, um, uh, for for example, uh, from uh, uh, in our context, from my recent uh, research, so that is a um, uh, that is a questionnaire uh, for two hundred and forty um, adolescents. Um, uh, 
we asked the question uh, for the adolescent, uh, uh, what is uh, the what are the usual practices of stress coping for them? So um, nearly, uh, so 46% of them would use uh, electronic devices uh, for stress coping. So only 1%, 1 percent, 1.3 percent would uh, uh, say that uh, they use um, uh, religious, they practice religious activities for uh, stress coping. And so others um, uh, YouTube uh, use YouTube or uh, some some would use uh, uh, bodily uh, practices like dancing or sports, but that is um, not the largest uh, percentage. So also about the channel, I think it is also about the um, uh, the channel um, and the languages uh, we uh, we can connect with the uh, adolescents and also the young adults. Uh, how uh, whether we could listen to them? Uh, uh, that is uh, what uh, uh, Chemical just mentioned. So uh, these all these are. Um, challenges and also find the final point would be uh, in our contest uh, the uh, changing uh, socio political situation uh, which uh, divides uh, people uh, into different uh, views and perspectives and it all it would uh, this would also the division of uh, perspectives and views about the society would also make um, uh, create uh, challenges uh, of communication. Uh, about uh, our spirituality and also other issues. Are there other challenges um, you would name? So we talked about the challenges that teachers and youth workers, um, faith leaders might face. Are there challenges that youth are facing that teachers and faith leaders need to recognize? And maybe Go ahead. I, th I think one of the challenges um, that I hear is, so a lot of, and again, speaking of spiritual practices, recognizing it's not the same as spirituality, but connected, right? So um, that a lot of spiritual practices that are talked about are that of being alone, being quiet, being in isolation, right? Um, which, which I am all for. Um, but you're also speaking to a current population that has spent a lot of times over the past couple of years being alone, being quiet, being in isolation. Um, can we talk about communal spiritual practices as well and the importance mm -hmm. of those? And how do we get back to communal spiritual practices, recognizing that still being together, right? Being outside is still weird and iffy for many, right? Um, so I think that's a current, a current reality of our times that we have to deal with, right? Um, that for some, like we've had enough alone time, right? Um, we need communal practices, but we need different practices. Additionally, I would add that how do we incorporate different technologies. As much as I understand the importance of unplugging, um, I also believe that the use of social media and technologies that our young adolescents do changes and affects the brain. And we could talk about the good and bad of that at another point in time, but we recognize it's a thing. Um, and it can be used to deepen one's spirituality, right? How can we update and, and talk about new practices. The ancient practices are wonderful, beautiful, should be taught and are great. And how do we also update and talk about new practices? Um, and I truly believe that spirituality is so all encompassing. Um, so many things can be a spiritual practice, right? I remember one particular part of my life where I, um, would do my morning prayers, kneeling by my bedside, making my bed became a spiritual practice because it was creating my altar in which I was going to pray near, right? Um, so it, it, became a, it became a moment of growth for me. Um, so how do we help you see and slow down and 
and, and be in the moment in particular ways so that it isn't here is your prescription, but how do we find the transcendent in the everyday, right? Um, how do we find the divine in the everyday um, and make it more of a, of a tangible thing <laughs> um, using new practices and new understandings for this new reality that we're all learning how to live into. Thank you. I want to, um, I have a question that I'll come back to and ask all the panelists to respond to. But um, before that, I would like to kind of turn our attention to the chat um, and ask the questions that people raise in the chat. And then I'm going to open it up to those who want to just ask the question. Um, but the first question I want to raise is, um, are we recognizing and able to name how today's youth are finding and defining spirituality. So how do youth find and define spirituality? Growing up in a vastly different global reality, are they not teaching each other new ways to be spiritual and faithful that is as equally valid as how we learn to define it? And so I think it's actually even perhaps speaking to um, Annie, your question about new practices, um, but want to throw this out there for um, panelists to respond to. Uh, I'd like to respond to that. that that's um, a very good question. Um, this past semester, I taught a class, um, 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 Faith Formation of Youth and Young Adults in a Digital Age. And um, uh, one of the things that I learned from that class was the importance of networking and how communication, how um, so much of what uh, people uh, who don't understand or have an understanding of what's taking place in social media uh, can be critical, uh, but it can certainly be some spiritual practices being engendered there. Uh, and it uh, those through those through the digital spaces, um, uh, and I think the the challenge then becomes for those of us who are in places of um, authority, so to speak. Um, are to is is to help create those spaces uh, and provide those spaces uh, in in a, a if we want it to be in a church setting or setting that that we want to engender a sense of spirituality. Uh, those things are there because they're young people are are creating those spaces already. And um, the question and and those yes those uh, those new spaces we just may not recognize them because. Uh, we might be too critical uh, to see the value in what uh, comes from um, the digital spaces. Um, so yes, I say definitely uh, we don't need to be caught. And, and that leads me to uh, another part of the challenge is that I think that one of our big challenges, and I alluded to it earlier, is about listening. Um, when we did interviews with, uh, with young people, uh, and and my own experience is that of listening uh, is becomes challenging for older adults uh, who say, okay, we want to listen to you, but we we heard you, but we're not going to do anything. We just heard what you said, but did we truly listen to what you said? And and as a result of that, that we created another dialogue with you. So yeah, those. But going back to the uh, uh, new ways of doing. I'm, I'm, Annie is right on point with that. I think those places are certainly available to us and, and uh, young people have already created them for many of us. And uh, we just need to listen to how they've been created. Music is one of the most, uh, you know, engaging experiences for young people, you know. So music can be, or especially in digital uh, space, Yes. Hearing of music, whether it's a uh, bhajan, which is a uh, in a Hindu temple, or a hymn in a church, or improvised jazz. One time, a, a student talking about spirituality talked about improvised jazz as being a spiritual experience. And then again, how do we raise, uh, create, you know, use these spaces, and and then follow those up by engaging students into explaining and reflecting and explaining as to 
what does that mean? Maybe they can express it through poetry, through prose, through movement. Um, once that digital experience has been shared, and I'm talking maybe in the context of music, they can move away and then express it in other formats, you know. Um, and one, one more thing, if I might add, uh, moving a little bit away from the digital, is that there are common themes when we talk about spirituality and diversity across faith traditions, think about something like water. Water is a, a common theme in different religions. You know, the, the Catholics, the Christians use it for baptism or for purity purposes. Uh, the Hindus use it, uh, you know, for Ganges River, which is water to wash away the sins. The Jewish people use it for purity bath. The Muslims use it for evolution before every prayer. Uh, and, and so water can be a very common theme that, uh, you know, youth from different traditions, faith traditions can gravitate to and then talk about projects like what Carmichael said about deeds, you know, earlier that how does it play out? How does spirituality, how can it be acted out? Maybe through conservation of water or through, you know, projects where, uh, you know, cleaning up streams or rivers to make the place, the areas clean. Uh, so it's not just only reflecting, but finding ways Something like fasting is a common theme. We don't realize it across religious traditions. Hindus fast, Christians fast, Jewish people fast, Baha'is fast. And so what, what kind of religious, uh, spiritual uh, uh, conversations can come out of that? Hunger can come out of it. What does it feel to be hungry? Are there people out there that are hungry? What social projects can be involved in? to, uh, you know, to do good deeds, you know, to take leadership in social charities and so on and so forth. So there are lots of ways in which there are interconnections that we need to think about and engage students both within their own faith traditions and across faith traditions. Thank you. Um, Karen Marie, um, talked about panelists in the plenary, um, about parents, caregivers, also talked about the importance of addressing existential issues with children and youth. So I wanted to raise the question, kind of where do you see the role of, like how does addressing existential issues with children and youth um, come into play when we're talking about adolescent spiritual nurture? What role does that play? Sorry, could, could you could you repeat what you just said? I'm sorry, I was distracted. Thank you. Sure. Um, the importance of addressing existential issues with children and youth. Um, what role does that play as it specifically as it relates to adolescent spiritual nurture? What role does addressing existential issues? Uh, I can add uh, one or two points, sorry. Um, uh, I think it's, uh, it can be related to the meaning of uh, being or the meaning of life and also the meaning of uh, death. Uh, for example, uh, even children, adolescents and young adults, they, they, ex they can experience uh, the passing away of their close friends and uh, relatives. Uh, for example, in the last term, uh, I did teach a course about uh, deaf education uh, for uh, pre-service teachers. And uh, some of them have experienced that about death of their uh, close friends uh, when um, uh, in their adolescent uh, period. And, and they, uh, they also, uh, in their um, reflective essay, they also wrote about that, uh, how, how all these um, uh, e events, the events of the passing away of their friends and also their um, maybe relatives or even family members, 
impact on the meaning of life or uh, the search of uh, meaning of life. And that would be uh, uh, exactly uh, the issue of uh, uh, spiritual, spirituality and also the um, uh, how they connect uh, with uh, spirituality. Would any other panelists like to speak to that? I think that as adolescents grow and begin to look at the world around them, they have lots of questions. And if you pay attention, you're gonna have existential crisis. Um, and the questions of theodicy come up, right? The questions of what is, what is going on? Does any of this matter, right? Um, all of these all of these questions about what is going on in the world um is there going to be a world when i am older right these are very hard difficult questions and i think for the purpose of sustaining oneself um that re realizing connecting with the divine transcendency all of these things um are necessary we've talked about the positive impacts of spirituality on adolescents, young adults, on people, right? Um, and how it positively impacts their lives and how it, um, how it roots people when they are going through difficulties, right? So whether it is a personal difficulty as you are watching, you know, family members pass or are you watching difficult things happen at schools or you're watching students, pass, you know, friends of yours pass away, or you're hiding under your desk because you got to prepare for an active shooter in your school, right? Um, all of these different things raise big questions. And spirituality is needed to help ground us <laughs> um, and give us a safe space to explore those questions and wonder and wonder what the divine has to do, or is there a divine or is a divine doing anything at all, right? And gives us a space to explore all of these things and hopefully in safe nurturing spaces. Yeah, and along that line, what Annie was saying, and I think that uh, going back again about the, to the question of expectations of teachers um, and youth workers, I think that number one, one of the number one uh, responsibilities is to create safe spaces. Um, and um, that is um, for those kind of conversations uh, to take place and dialogue to take place to create those safe place, places. I want to raise. Um, Oh, oh go sorry. Ahead. No, no, go ahead. I just want to give response to uh, uh is it Monique? Monique uh when mm -hmm. Wendy. Yeah, um, yeah, I just yeah, what I what I just mentioned about the uh, um uh from my course uh deaf education that um a male student, so a university student, a male university student, um uh shared with me on the first lesson that uh, he he had experienced two two suicides of uh, his friends when he was an adolescent so uh and also in asian contests uh, in hong kong and also japan and korea the 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 suicide rate of uh, adolescents and young adults are uh, has been uh, has been quite high and increasing and also in mainland China in the past few years. Um, so all these are happening and all these are related to uh, searching of meaning of life and also spirituality. And also we create space. How, how can we create space for them, for the adolescents and young adults to reflect and also to share uh, uh, uh we, we, we don't require them to reflect or something. At least we create space for dialogue and for them to share. And uh, and the last last thing I would like to share that is the male student, uh, my male uh, university student, he reflects about, uh, he because he, he experienced two suicides of um, his friends uh, a few years ago, and, and he had strong desire of also uh, sui uh, committing suicide. And um, 
uh, and fortunately he um uh he explored uh, the meaning of life and uh, and uh, with um with uh, his uh, strong um uh, faith and and that's how and and with this course and uh, he could uh, have the space and uh, for uh, communicating uh, or talking about these issues that uh, he he didn't have chance to talk about so thank you thank you I um I want to raise Nelson's question and then Noel I see your hand so I'll come to you um in your conversations with adolescents have they identified or observed practices that have questioned their reflections on spirituality? Mm. Can you repeat that, Sarah? Right there. Sure. Um, and Nelson, do you want to do you want to ask the question since you raised it in the chat? Do you? Okay, I. Uh, I wonder whether there were any negative practices or practices that disturbed them in reflecting on their own spirituality that they observed um, from uh, other adults or their peers. Have all the have I guess have all the practices they observe have been positive for them? Well, this is where religion and spirituality can be kind of put to test. My sense is probably because spirituality is so internal, it's so the inner work of one's life. Whereas religion is more the practice and the rituals, and you know, it can be more external. And so if somebody is observing, probably it's the religious part that is being observed. And if it is to be negative, it's likely that the person that was witnessed, that uh, was it witnessed by the adolescents or any of us, um, you know, that religion became such a noose around the neck, for example, that, the, that person became intolerant of others or you know, we have suicide bombings, you know, whatever, you know, that they, 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 there are get to the extreme where those practices actually become detrimental because of the closeness and the narrowness of how one defines religion. But I would think that a spiritual person is more enlightened person. And I would hope that there would be not be any negative experiences being around spiritual people, but more likely if we are around religious people who are very narrow and stern in their uh, dogmatic in their practices. I hope I'm making sense. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, Noel, I see your hands. So I wanna invite you to ask your question. Uh, Yes, thanks. And uh, this is, uh, <clears throat> in my view, been a very interesting discussion. And it certainly uh, is rare. So I'm very glad I uh, checked in, <laughs> see how it went. Um, <clears throat> the uh, one of the uh, models that I have used for understanding religion uh, both as teaching in religious studies and uh, then in religious education <clears throat> has been a six dimensional uh, model uh, proposed by Nini and Spart in the 1960s. And uh, one of the dimensions of religion is, is uh, what he called experiential dimension. And that's where I tend to locate spirituality. And from much of what I've heard, uh, that is it. And the spirituality, I think basically when you're talking about, uh, especially preschool, early education, adolescent, uh, it's a spirituality, it's experience that precedes the real development of, of uh, religious personality that is related to specific doctrines and rituals and uh, social structures and so on. And uh, 
uh, no, that's just in the background. Uh, my uh, question or observation is uh, in, in the matter of uh, spirit, spirituality itself, I, uh, in my mind, the fundamental concept is simply beyond. When anyone somehow feels there's more to this than me and the world around me and everything I understand, then you've moved into something that could be described as a spiritual experience. And I'm just wondering, uh, in your various uh, uh, connections with uh, children, adolescents, young adults, adults, uh, <clears throat> where you, you have come across uh, individuals who have experienced the beyond and yet have set it aside because there's plenty to deal with in what is not beyond. Beginning with uh, oneself, getting along with oneself, one's others, one's relationships, one's uh, career, and so on. So that's, that's the, the question I would have. And uh, I'll leave it at there. Any Sorry. of our panelists? Oh, go ahead. Noel, I, I just uh, uh, sent in a, a question in the chat. If you could share the resource uh, for the six uh, models you have used in teaching uh, or, uh, or studying the, this uh, 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 spiritual nurture, please. Noel, I think that was for you. If you want to put yes. that. Yes. So, yes. It's uh, the name of the author. And uh, is Ninian Smart, N I N I A N. And the last name is simply Smart, S M A R T. And I think if you Google that, uh, that name, you'll simply come up with uh, a variety of things that he's written. Uh, but in almost all of them, he goes back to that uh, fundamental model of uh, the various dimensions of religion. And as dimensions, you can't talk about one and say, well, that's what religion is without talking and realizing how they affect ev everything else, so. Thank you. Do any of our panelists wanna quickly respond to the question or comment that Noel raised? Do you have any responses for that question? Well, well, it seemed like I was hearing uh, Noel's talk about the sense that um, the people, uh, young people, I will, will say young people, whatever age, but they will say uh, youth, uh, adolescents, experiencing the spiritual, the experiencing, um, but uh, somehow moving away from it, I think that's what I was saying. Uh, I was hearing him say, um, I was immediately um, thought about um, a parable that Jesus tells about um, the, the sowing and the seeds and how um, the cares of the world um, will cause one to walk away from or even what they already know. I mean, that's uh, and, and speaking of the sowing. And I, I think that I've seen that often where, where people who were uh, what we might say spiritual, uh, but the cares of the world and all of the other things sort of drowned all that out and the person sort of moved away or had issues and concerns uh, that uh, led to that, that moving away from it. And I think in a sense, maybe all of us do that from time to time uh, as, as because of the, the cares of the world. Thank you. Um, with five minutes left, I did want to ask each of the panelists if they could give a 30 second response to this question. And it's just what positive approaches might you share um, with us about uh, adolescent spiritual nurture or adolescents in general? 
Do you have any positive approaches you would share in 30 seconds? Well, I'll say in 30 seconds that I think two, two, two things. Um, I think that um, opportunities for intergenerational um, engagement um, will help with uh, the spirituality of, of adolescence. And also the second point of just listening um, because young people want to be heard. Thank you. Okay, my turn. Yes. So I would like to share a more, uh, share a slide. Uh, can you see? Okay. Yes. So uh, uh, this is one of the way that uh, uh, the contemplative uh, practices or contemplative uh, pedagogy as as one of the uh, the two or dimension uh, for uh, to be included in. Um, education in school or uh, education, uh, spiritual education uh, in other contexts. So uh, uh, in this um, in this uh, diagram, you, you can see the uh, uh, there is, so it in, it's inclusive way approach uh, of uh, spiritual practices, uh, including music, singing, um, uh, yoga, uh, Qigong or uh, silence uh, centering. Uh, so um, uh, so the youth and adolescents, they can make their own uh, uh, choice uh, uh, for uh, developing the spirituality of that all. Thank you. I would add, I would echo listening. <laughs> Um, and then I would add flexibility, creativity, and imagination. Um, that since the resources of spirituality are all around us, um, there are many, many things we can learn from what has come before us, and there is many more for us to create together. Um, so, and I have yet to met more creative minds than children and adolescents. Thank you. Um, wonderful ideas. Thank you all for sharing all that. Um, in terms of, um, again, adolescence, there is, as Annie said, and there's so much of creativity, but also there's a lot within them. There's a lot of crisis that's happening, you know, because of that stage, the hormonal changes. And, and so there is likelihood that because of uncertainties and all that, that it's an acutely emotional time for adolescents. And so in terms of creating spaces, maybe one of the space that may be created is what I would identify or uh, uh, you know, label as a peace table, P-E-A-C-E -E table, or a space where adolescents can, you know, sit there, they can, um, if there are conflicts, it could be a conflict resolution type of table, where they are able to voice out, and rather than using muscle, they use the mind, and, and uh, talk about to each other, to their peers, their inner feelings or their anger or about their, you know, whatever feelings they are going through to the point where the peace table is where they cannot leave it, move away from it till they have resolved it with their peers. So in those spaces that we talked about, that could be a physical place where in a classroom, if you're talking about education, where there can be a place of, of resolution and uh, conflict resolution and coming to understanding and sharing about that internal spirituality that will enlighten each other, you know, and uh, make, make a world a better place, you know, for themselves and for the others. And if I may, uh, Sarah, I would like to just briefly talk about 
a book that I co-edited with a group of uh, four other editors and 22 authors from around who are deeply involved in spiritual work. And the book is uh, about to be released, although you will see in this, and I'm going to just, uh, the book is entitled uh, uh, Supporting Children and Youth Through Spiritual Education. And uh, it's going to be released uh, hopefully in a couple of weeks, maybe. Uh, and there are lots of good ideas. The first part of the book is the conceptual aspect of spirituality, uh, giving different perspectives about the difference between religion and spirituality and the similarities and how we will get to understand the concept of spirituality. The second part is practices. How does a teacher, educator practice spirituality and again, create these different spaces? And the third part is research being done in the area of spirituality. And so the work is being done in collaboration with Columbia University. One of the editors is from Columbia University. Uh, the authors range, you know, from Tony Yu, maybe some of those names you might be familiar with, Lisa Miller, um, you know, Brendan Hyde, all those people have, have contributed to this book. And uh, I hope that you will get to read it. Uh, the target uh, audience is religious leaders, non-religious leaders who are truly involved in the well-being of young people, uh, the well-being of their inner, inner lives, and how to help them uh, overcome many of the crises that we talked about, whether it's suicide, whether it's climate change, all that is happening around and how we might support children and youth through spiritual education. So check it out. Um, just wanted to share that. And thank you for letting me do that. Thank you. And that link is in the chat. If you could also show love to our panelists, um, you can drop some uh, uh, emojis or whatever in the chat.